Seated next to Cambodia's world-famous Angkor Wat Temple and Palace lies Srasrang Reservoir, a magnificent body of water that archaeologists were in the process of draining. And while the team executing the project knew the bed below would yield a variety of intriguing artifacts, something truly astonishing finally appeared from the mud. It seemed to be a massive beast, and incredibly, researchers believe it dates back several centuries. When workers drained a holy lake in Cambodia, this ancient creature emerged from the depths. Behind the startling find is Apsara, a Cambodian agency that conserves and maintains the 400-acre Angkor complex. Chi Sachiat led the research team at the 12th-century man-made reservoir, which includes a temple named Kandal Srasrang. Fascinatingly, the temple is only visible for part of the year, then entirely submerged during Cambodia's annual rainy season. And experts believe that the Srasrang Reservoir which is about 2,300 feet long and almost 1,000 feet wide, may have been built as a place of worship for Kama. Kama is the Hindu deity of creativity and love, and believed to have been the first child of chaos the god who, it said, enabled all of creation. And with the lavishly decorated surroundings, it's clear that this is a location of some significance. Accordingly, archaeologists have uncovered various intriguing objects at the Candle Srasrang temple, including a couple of tridents and various pieces of crystal. Also among the finds was a depiction of a naga, a legendary beast that's said to be part snake and part human. The temple itself was originally constructed during the 10th century and then remodeled sometime around 1200. And it seems that officials from Apsara were in no doubt about the significance of these discoveries at Candle Srasrang. A representative of the organization, Long Kosal, told the Phnom Penh Post, We are so happy we found these antiquities. They'll help us understand the history, purpose, and arrangement of the Candle Srasrang temple. However, the item that arguably received the most press coverage was the aforementioned mysterious creature and it may tell us more about what once went on at the Angkor Wat complex. The construction of what would eventually become more than 400 acres of exquisite Khmer architecture originally began during the 12th century. Sir Yeberman II, the head of the Khmer kingdom at the time, was the one to initiate the project, which, in its early days, was intended as a tribute to the Hindu deity Vishnu. By the end of the 12th century, however, it had become a Buddhist place of worship. And the temple site itself along with that ancient beast is in northern Cambodia, just a few miles from the nation's fifth most populous city of Siem Reap. Angkor Wat was built, then, during the Khmer dynasty, which reigned over much of Southeast Asia until the middle of the 15th century. And the stunningly ornate temples, palaces and other buildings that occupy the complex are perhaps the crowning jewels of the civilization's legacy. Angkor Wat is notable, too, for being arguably the biggest religious site on the planet. Initially, though, Sir Yeverman II's purpose in commissioning this enormous edifice was to create a magnificent tomb for himself. And there was yet another use for the vast array of buildings at Angkor Wat, hundreds of years ago, they also served as the administrative base of the Khmer Empire. But while experts believe that the complex took nearly four decades to construct, a Buddhist legend claims instead that the deity Indra played a crucial part in the endeavor and required just a single night to complete it, too. Still, regardless of whether Angkor Wat was made by God or man, it was an extraordinary feat of design and engineering. According to messages inscribed on some of the buildings, the original project involved more than a quarter of a million craftsmen and laborers who worked with the assistance of thousands of elephants. And experts now believe that the buildings there were crafted using sandstone blocks that had been transported to the site via waterways. It should be known, though, that while the whole site is often loosely referred to as Angkor Wat, that name should strictly speaking only apply to the temple at the center of the complex. This magnificent edifice boasts five tapering towers, which are a reference to the summit of the mythological Mount Meru, home to the Hindu deities. After Sir Yeverman II's death, However, Angkor Wat's fate may have looked less secure. Y.A. Overman II succeeded the monarch until 1166, when a government officer overthrew him in a palace uprising. And after that, it seems that anarchy ensued for around a decade. The Cham people, whose kingdom was within the borders of present-day Vietnam, 
exploited the situation in any case by taking control of the Khmer Kingdom. Then, in 1177, the man who would later rule as King Jayavarman VII mustered an army and threw the invaders out of Angkor. But it seems that Jayavarman felt that in allowing the Chams to occupy Angkor Wat, the Hindu deities had been of little help. As a result, he decided instead to devote the Angkor Wat complex to Buddhism. Jayavarman VII ruled until around 1220, and after that the Khmer Kingdom and the buildings of Angkor Wat both appear to have slid into a long-lasting decline. Yes, while the complex was never completely deserted and remained a center for devout Buddhists, its splendid buildings were neglected. Then, when the Ayutthaya people of modern-day Thailand seized Angkor Wat in 1431, the Khmers subsequently moved their capital to Phnom Penh, which remains Cambodia's principal city in the present day. However, Angkor Wat would come to further attention in the late 16th century, when Antonio da Madelena, a monk from Portugal, stumbled across the site. And while he may not have seen the incredible creature that would one day be unearthed, he was still mightily impressed. In 2017 the BBC quoted da Madelena's words as recorded by his countryman Diogo do Caudo, with the religious man apparently saying, Angkor Wat is of such extraordinary construction that it is not possible to describe it with a pen, particularly since it is like no other building in the world. It has towers and decoration and all the refinements which the human genius can conceive of. But it would be another 270 years or so before the Western fascination with Angkor Wat's extraordinary architecture truly flickered into life. The catalyst was a Frenchman, Henry Mauhet, who first visited the site during an expedition to Southeast Asia in 1859 and 1860. Unfortunately, Mauhit would pass away apparently of malaria at Angkor Wat in 1861. Still, before his untimely demise at the age of 35, Mauhit had time to write up observations about the site that were published after his death. The explorer said of Angkor Wat, one of these temples a rival to that of Solomon and erected by some ancient Michelangelo, might take an honorable place beside our most beautiful buildings. It is grander than anything left to us by Greece or Rome, and it presents a sad contrast to the state of barbarism in which the nation is now plunged Mauhit's description of the complex continued. Seemingly displaying his Eurocentric bias, Mauhit seems to have been flabbergasted that Southeast Asians could have built something so magnificent. Yet while Mauhit's account of Angkor Wat brought it to the attention of the world, his glowing praise came well before the site became a mass tourist attraction. Cambodia became a French protectorate in 1863, and from the beginning of the 20th century, the colonialists made piecemeal efforts to restore Angkor Wat to its previous glory. Cambodia then gained its independence from France in 1953 and was ruled by King Norodom Sihanouk. During his time in power, Sihanouk also variously held the positions of president and prime minister, as well as that of monarch. But dark days came for the Cambodians in 1975, when Khmer Rouge guerrillas seized control of the country. Now under the sway of the ruthless Khmer Rouge tyrant Pol Pot, the nation endured four years of bloodshed. Around one and a half million Cambodians lost their lives under the brutal grip of the Khmer Rouge, with society being disrupted from top to bottom. This tragic period lasted until 1979, when an invasion by Vietnamese troops overturned the murderous regime. A Vietnam-supported government then ruled Cambodia until the early 1990s, when full independence and democracy were introduced. And during the turmoil of the Pol Pot years, restoration work on Angkor Wat was at a complete standstill. The site became a battlefield at one point, in fact, with bullet marks still visible on some of the sandstone buildings. Then, in 1992, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, gave Angkor World Heritage Site status. Even so, it would be several more years before the world began to flock to the complex. Journalist Jonathan Glancy was one of those who made the journey in the 1990s so, before the current influx of tourists. Describing his experience to the BBC in 2017, Glancy wrote, When I came here to Angkor Wat in the mid-1990s, I would have been one of around 7,500 annual visitors, last year, there were 2.5 million visitors, with very many from China. That's right. 
In the 21st century, the splendor of Angkor Wat has seemingly made it a must-see for travelers from across the globe. And in recent decades, our knowledge about the extent of the sprawling Angkor Wat complex has greatly increased. Starting in 2007, archaeologists Jean-Baptiste Chivens and Damien Evans have been employing NASA radar technology in order to create a true picture of what was once at the site. During their investigations, then, Evans and Chivens showed that the urban spread of Angkor Wat was much wider than was previously known. The pair even uncovered a lost city called Mahindraparvata, which would have once been connected to the temple complex 25 miles away. And the aerial mapping exercise has revealed other sophisticated elements of the area around Angkor Wat, including what Glancy has described as a sprawling city at least as big as Berlin. Describing the discovery made by Evans and Chevens, Glancy wrote, This, perhaps, was the first low-density city, a phenomenon normally associated with the railway age, the car and the spread of suburbia. It was a vast-reaching conurbation, its parts linked by an ambitious network of roads and canals, reservoirs and dams carved from the forest. So, with Angkor Wat now firmly ensconced as one of the great wonders of human civilization, it's perhaps no surprise that archaeological exploration of the huge site continues today. And that brings us back to the discoveries of the dig we mentioned earlier at the Srasrang Reservoir. As you'll remember, the water feature was drained in March 2020 to allow an examination of its bed. And as previously outlined, researchers uncovered various fascinating artifacts, including that carving of a naga. But one find seemingly topped all the others. From the reservoir's muddy bottom, an ancient sandstone rendition of a turtle emerged, with the object thought to have been created in the 10th century. More specifically, this turtle was revealed as the archaeologists excavated at the site of the Candle Srasrang Temple. The place of worship had once stood on a man-made island in the middle of the reservoir, with the researchers having determined its location before draining the waters so that they could investigate the location in detail and it's since been determined that the sandstone turtle comes in at 37 inches in length and 23 inches in width. Describing the significance of the artifact, Sachi told Smithsonian Magazine, the turtle is known as one of the avatars of the Hindu god Vishnu. Sometimes, turtles are placed as a votive object in a temple's foundations or at its center. Sachi continued, as for the turtle we found, we don't know its purpose yet. However, according to our preliminary assessment, the turtle was probably prepared to be placed at the temple's foundation. It could also be a valuable stone, which was placed for the celebration of any religious ceremony during that time. Indeed, turtles held an important position in the iconography of several ancient Eastern cultures. Chinese and Indian civilizations, for example, regarded the turtle as symbolic of the universe. And stone sculptures of turtles are in fact ubiquitous among the buildings of Angkor Wat, appearing frequently as freestanding statues, such as the Srasrang animal, or an etched reliefs mounted on buildings. Writing in the Khmer Times after the discovery of the Srasrang turtle, historian Chem Rithai of the Asian Vision Institute pointed out, beyond their roles in the sacred legends of Angkor, turtles serve many other purposes in the belief system of modern Cambodia. He added that releasing turtles into the wild as a way to show religious devotion is still a common practice today. Regrettably, though, as Rithai has noted, turtles in modern Cambodia and elsewhere in the region are also victims of wildlife crime, with their flesh valued for food and their body parts used in traditional medicine. It's believed, you see, that eating turtles can guarantee a long life. And this illegal poaching of turtles naturally presents an existential threat to the animals. Nonetheless, as Rithai pointed out, the turtle king, Kerma Raja, was formerly worshipped as a guardian of Angkor culture. Speaking about the newly discovered turtle, he claimed to hope that this symbol of our glorious past may inspire a revival of spiritual respect towards Kerma Raja by modern Cambodians and contribute to the protection of this endangered species. Meanwhile, Sachia told the Khmer Times, although previous studies were conducted about the Candle Srasrang temple, there has been no in-depth research about it or where various objects have been buried. Our recent discovery can help explain the history of the temple, including the religious ceremonies that were once performed here. Yet although the turtle is carved in a smooth and featureless style, it does have one visible anomaly. 
Specifically, cuts in the center of the carved animal's shell make a rectangular shape that looks very much like a lid. And upon closer examination, it turned out that this feature was indeed the covering of a small recessed chamber in the turtle's back. Speaking to the Phnom Penh Post, Sachiet said, we opened the turtle shell and found water and solid mud in it. Until we cleaned everything out of there, we only saw mud and dirt. We did not attempt to dig more out of it as we were afraid of damaging the original shape. The hole in the turtle where the artifacts were found is 4 inches white and 2 inches deep. The relics themselves remain mysterious, though, and Sachiet is asked for international help in identifying them. So, thanks to the efforts of modern researchers, the breathtaking complex of palaces, temples and water features spread across the Angkor Wat site continue to yield their secrets. And while the location may have a checkered history, it remains an eloquent witness to the sophistication of the ancient Khmer people, not to mention their reverence for turtles. In another part of the world, though, an even more famous landmark was drained back in the 60s. And after workers had dammed Niagara Falls in a bid to help stop erosion there, they received a disturbing surprise. Something shocking, it seemed, had been hidden among the rocks. It's June 1969, and a team of engineers has succeeded in a Herculean task. Against the odds, they have stemmed the flow of Niagara Falls, thus silencing one of the most famous attractions on planet Earth. But as the water dries up for the first time in thousands of years, a secret is revealed on the rocks below, and it's a horrific one, too. Today, the mighty roar of Niagara Falls draws millions of tourists to the area every year. And for many, the churning waters are a constant reminder of just how powerful Mother Nature can be. But over five decades ago, the famous torrent became a mere trickle, while engineers investigated what was happening behind the scenes. On that occasion, man trumped nature in a staggering show of what engineering can achieve. And as the waterfall began to recede, visitors gathered to witness a spectacle that had never been seen before. But what was revealed after Niagara Falls was stopped in its tracks? Well, as it turned out, something sinister had been hiding beneath the spray. The story of Niagara Falls began around 18,000 years ago, when advancing ice sheets carved great swathes into the landscape that would become North America. Then, when the ice melted, it sent a cascade of water flowing into the Niagara River. And over time, this torrent eroded nearby cliffs and created the natural wonder that we know and love today. Now, Niagara Falls sits on the border of the United States and Canada and is one of the most recognizable landmarks in the world. That said, it's not known exactly how long humans have been aware of its existence. And while there are no written records of such events, it's likely that the region's indigenous communities were the first to marvel at the wonder of the falls. But although the French explorer Samuel de Champlain first heard rumors of a vast waterfall in the region at the beginning of the 17th century, it wasn't until 1678 that Niagara was first recorded by Europeans. That year, a priest named Father Louis Henpin witnessed the astonishing spectacle while on an expedition into what was then known as New France. Then, five years after stumbling across the falls, Henpin published a new discovery, in which he described his incredible find. There, the name Niagara thought to come from the Iroquoian word Angiara meaning the strait, appeared for the first time. And with Westerners now aware of the Cascades, more and more travelers started to flock to the region. In the 1800s railroad passenger numbers increased, too, and Niagara Falls began to develop as a tourist destination. Soon, a wide variety of amenities had sprung up to cater for the influx of visitors, many of whom were honeymooning couples. But it wasn't just local hoteliers who saw potential for profit in the mighty attraction. By the end of the 19th century, you see, industrialists had realized that the water tumbling over the falls had a value all of its own. By harnessing the force of the torrent, in fact, they could power their factories and mills. So in 1895 a hydroelectric generating station the first major facility of its kind that the world had ever seen opened in the region. But although the station was innovative, it could only carry electricity some 300 feet. Thankfully, then, in 1896 the famous inventor Nikola Tesla took things to the next level. By using his knowledge of alternating current, he was able to divert power more than 20 miles away to Buffalo, New York. Tesla made history with his alternating current induction motor, in fact, 
while his Niagara experiments marked the earliest use of a system that still carries electricity around the world today. And more than 100 years later, hydroelectricity is still generated by the falls, with the plants there able to produce up to 2.4 million kilowatts of power. Today, Niagara Falls is divided between two nations, with both a U.S. and a Canadian side. And between them, the two communities host around 30 million tourists every year. During peak times, visitors watch water tumble down at a rate of 6 million cubic feet per minute. Interestingly, though, the amount of water coming over the falls significantly decreases at night. You see, a treaty from 1950 allows local companies to divert more of the flow into their power plants at times when the spectacular view will be least affected. And that's not the only time that the volume of Niagara Falls has altered over the years. In 2019, for example, the attraction took on an entirely different appearance when unusually cold temperatures saw it freeze over in places. And although some water still made it over the edge of the cataract, great quantities proceeded to turn into clouds of vapor long before it reached the basin. But while this has happened a number of times over the years, experts insist that the flow never actually stops. So has Niagara Falls ever really ground to a halt? Well, part of it has. Technically, the famous landmark is actually three separate waterfalls. As well as the iconic Horseshoe Falls, which span the border between the United States and Canada, there are two smaller cataracts situated solely on U.S. soil. The American Falls and the Bridal Veil Falls. By 1965, however, citizens of Niagara Falls, New York, had grown concerned that the natural wonder on their side of the border was beginning to lose its charm. In particular, a growing deposit of talus the rock that accumulates at the base of a waterfall was a major worry. Apparently, the talus was preventing water from descending in a sheer drop and, according to some, affecting the aesthetic appeal of the American Falls. On January 31, 1965, an article highlighting the issue appeared on the front of the Niagara Falls Gazette newspaper. In the piece, local journalist Cliff Spieler argued that persistent erosion may eventually eradicate the American Falls altogether. And soon after that, a campaign to save the landmark began, with the crusade aiming to put pressure on the government to come up with a solution. Hoping to tackle the issue, the American and Canadian authorities thus looked to the International Joint Commission IJC, an organization that oversees regulations relating to shared waters. But while the experts buckled down to find an answer, a temporary operation was launched to eliminate any detritus from the waters above the falls. In order to achieve this, it was first necessary to deflect the flow of water over the American Falls. And so on November 13, 1966, a clever plan was put into action. Upriver, the International Water Control Dam was pushed into overdrive, its gates wrenched wide open to allow the current in. At the same time, the hydro-generating stations were also up to complete capacity. Owing to these measures, the amount of water flowing over the falls was reduced from 60,000 gallons per second to just 15,000. And as the river receded, workmen duly waded out and began clearing away the debris. In the meantime, officials from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or USIS, also grabbed the opportunity to take a closer look at the exposed bed. Keen to come up with a long-term plan to protect the American Falls, the USIS team also snapped aerial photographs of the scene. After six hours, however, the diversions were closed and the flow of the river returned to normal. And, as it happens, this short exercise laid the groundwork for a far more ambitious operation that would take place down the line. Then, two years after the campaign to save the American Falls first gained traction, the IJC initiated the American Falls International Board. And soon, the board realized that an even more ambitious approach was required. If the problem of erosion was to be solved, it seemed, a way of completely dewatering the falls had to be found. Ultimately, this undertaking fell to a group of engineers from USIS. And, soon, a plan began to form. Indeed, while the 1966 approach had succeeded in reducing the volume of water moving over the American Falls to 25% of its usual flow, more drastic action was now needed. So, officials drew up a plan for a type of temporary structure known as a cofferdom. Typically, 
These dams are constructed inside bodies of water when a certain section of, for example, a lake needs to be dried out. In the case of the Niagara River, however, the engineers sought to take a different approach. Instead, their cofferdom would take the form of a 600-foot barrier stretching across the current. USIS also handed a contract of almost half a million dollars to the Albert Elia Construction Company. And in exchange for its fee the equivalent of almost four million dollars in today's money the firm took on the task of making the cofferdom. But it wasn't just responsible for drying out the falls, as it happens. In particular, the Albert Elia Construction Company was also tasked with scouring the riverbed while it was exposed. On top of this, its workers were also directed to remove any loose boulders from the surface of the falls and to introduce a sprinkler system that would deliver moisture to the rock. So, on June 9, 1969, the operation began. But as workmen attempted to construct a dam across the raging rapids, they found themselves in a precarious situation. If someone fell into the water, for example, there would have been nothing to stop them from plunging over the edge of the falls. Ultimately, then, it was decided to install a lifeline in the middle of the river that would connect Goat Island and the mainland. Apparently, the idea was that any workers unlucky enough to plummet down towards the river would have had something to grab onto before being pushed over the edge. Fortunately, though, no incidences of this lifeline being used were recorded at the time. And gradually, over the course of three days, the dam began to take shape. However, it was no simple task. In fact, over the course of construction, in excess of 1,200 trucks carried multiple loads of earth and rock to the American Falls and dumped them upstream of the cataract. And so by the end of the operation, almost 28,000 tons of material had been shifted to the site. Finally, on June 12, 1969, the workmen completed their task by plugging up the final breach in the cofferdom. Stretching all the way from the mainland to Goat Island, the structure successfully accomplished the seemingly impossible. And for the first time in more than 12,000 years, the American Falls ran dry. Despite this impressive feat, however, some locals worried that halting the falls would impact tourism in the region. And it was a valid concern, after all, 5 million visitors helped the local economy every year. Others believed, by contrast, that the unique opportunity to see what was beneath the water would actually attract crowds. Ultimately, visitor numbers did decline during 1969 after the drying up of the falls. Nevertheless, those who did make it to the area were rewarded with a spectacular sight. And as the waters receded, several coins appeared on the riverbed, prompting delighted tourists to scoop these up as souvenirs. In fact, curious visitors had begun arriving the day after Eusis successfully turned off the falls. According to reports, the braver among them took tentative steps out onto the riverbed, with some even approaching the edge of the waterfall. However, most at the scene appeared content with a glimpse of the cofferdom that had achieved such an apparently improbable task. But alongside all the novelty and excitement, something gruesome was revealed beneath the weight of the American Falls that year. On the riverbed, observers spotted two sets of remains from a man and a woman who had each met their fate somewhere in the fearsome waters. According to contemporary reports, the deceased male had jumped into the channel above the American Falls on the day before the waters had dried up. In fact, observers at the time initially assumed that he was part of the official operation. But when the young man, clad in green pants and a similarly huge shirt, plunged into the current, the onlookers ultimately realized that something was amiss. Given the timing of the man's fatal leap, the authorities didn't have to wait long to be able to recover his body. During the next day, then, four police officers scanned the now dry riverbed in search of human remains. But while they ultimately located the deceased, whose name has not been recorded, they made another grim discovery along the way. While scouring the riverbed, the officers also stumbled upon the remains of a woman wearing a red and white striped garment. And, apparently, her body was significantly decomposed, indicating that she had been in the water for quite a while prior. But who was she, and how had she ended up in the falls? Hoping to get to the bottom of the mystery, authorities removed the remains and ordered that an autopsy take place. But again, the identity of the woman has not been recorded. What was revealed at the time, though, was the tragic fact that she had been wearing a wedding band. 
And on the inside of the ring, there was a hair trending inscription. Forget me not. Sadly, these two were far from the only people to have lost their lives at Niagara Falls. It seems surprising that the operation did not reveal more bodies hiding beneath the water, in fact. After all, there are many people who unwittingly or otherwise have tumbled from the top over the years. These days, experts estimate that up to 40 deaths occur every year as a result. And although many of the deceased are people who had attempted to take their own lives, a number of accidents have also contributed to the death toll at Niagara Falls. Since 1829 a series of daredevils have also attempted to survive the terrifying plunge, although only a handful have actually succeeded. Among the most famous of these adventurers is 63-year-old teacher Annie Edson Taylor, who in 1901 survived a plunge over the falls while encased in a wooden barrel. And upon emerging from her stunt relatively unscathed, she reportedly exclaimed, no one would ever do that again. Yet not everyone has taken Taylor's advice, as many have since followed in her footsteps to varying degrees of success. In 1984, for example, Canadian stuntman Carol Sousek managed to survive a trip in a barrel over the falls. Sadly, though, he died the following year at the Houston Astrodome in Texas, while trying to relive his famous stunt. And a 1990 American Jesse Sharp attempted to tackle the Cascades armed with just a canoe, but he was never seen again. For those watching the draining of the American Falls, the discovery on the riverbed was a stark reminder of the water feature's deadly power. But it was business as usual for the authorities, who took out the remains and continued with the operation. Apparently, the first step was to get rid of the loose rocks located on the face of the waterfall. In order to do so, workers were encased in cages attached to cranes and dangled over the lip of the falls. And at the same time, engineers put in a sprinkler system designed to continually moisten the layer of shale on the face of the waterfall. According to experts, the rock had been drying out, making it more vulnerable to erosion. Meanwhile, workers set about drilling into the riverbed at the top of the American Falls. Then, once the team had reached the 180-foot point, they began setting up tests to measure the absorbency levels of the rock. Elsewhere, surveyors seized the opportunity to chart the contours of the surface of the falls. As geological surveys continued at the falls, construction commenced on a walkway that would allow visitors to travel safely along the riverbed. And on August 1, 1969, this attraction opened to the public for the first time. But even though the walkway proved popular, it was not enough to boost visitor numbers to normal levels. Finally, on August 19, researchers began studying the deposit of talus at the foot of the falls. By drilling holes deep into the rocks, it seems, they hoped to learn more about the formation. However, it soon became apparent that the cleanup operation would not be as simple as the specialists had hoped. In fact, engineers studying the American Falls concluded that the talus played a vital role in supporting the cliff face behind. Faced with the challenges of removal, then, the authorities initially put forward an alternative plan. By constructing a permanent dam, they reasoned, they could boost the water level in the basin and submerge the offending rocks. But creating a dam would be far from a flawless solution, as it would weaken the American Falls significantly. Consequently, the authorities ultimately decided that they would leave the talus as it was. But the entire operation was not completely in vain, as engineers utilized the unusual situation to perform vital conservation work on the cliff face. Over the course of six months, teams got to work with anchors, bolts and cables to stabilize the American Falls. Elsewhere, they introduced sensors designed to alert the authorities if a landslide was imminent. And the crew's work has apparently had a significant impact on conserving the waterfall for many generations to come, too. Eventually, in November 1969, the work was done. And after the cofferdam was destroyed using dynamite, the American Falls returned to its former glory. At the time, moreover, the IJC felt that it had taken steps towards protecting the natural wonder, rather than turning it into something artificial. Ironically, though, the Niagara Falls of 1969 was very different to the one that European explorers had discovered centuries earlier. Early industry had taken such a toll on the region, in fact, that conservation efforts were already underway by the 1800s. 
The business is dependent on the power of the Cascades, however, merely relocated downstream. And by the beginning of the 20th century, a significant amount of water was being redirected from the falls to power various establishments, thus convincing many that the natural beauty of the Cascades was diminishing. A debate therefore began as to how to best balance industry with conservation. According to the industrialists, their plants were actually helping to conserve the falls by limiting the amount of water pouring over the lip. And while erosion had typically been occurring at a rate of four and a half feet per year, the business people believed that a decreased water flow would help prevent this from happening. Then the United States and Canada reached an agreement. Ultimately, you see, both nations wanted industrial activity to continue in the region, but with the illusion that it was not affecting the mighty flow of Niagara Falls. So, how could they continue to divert the river without creating a noticeable impact on the famous attraction? Well, in the end, Canada and the U.S. agreed to an innovative solution. During evenings and in winter, they divert as much as 75% of the water destined for Niagara Falls. At peak times when visitors were more likely, however, that amount would be reduced to 50%. In the meantime, experts artificially altered the lip of the famous Horseshoe Falls in order to create the illusion of a powerful flow. Amazingly, these diversions still exist today, meaning tourists see only a fraction of the water actually meant for Niagara Falls. Nevertheless, the Cascades remain one of the world's most popular tourist attractions. And soon, visitors may get another chance to see what secrets are hiding beneath the spray. In 2016 the Niagara Frontier State Park Commission announced plans to dry out the American Falls again in the near future. More than a century earlier, you see, two stone bridges had been built to span the gap between the mainland and Goat Island. By 2005, however, these structures had deteriorated to the point where restoration was no longer an option. So, in order to replace the bridges, the commission announced, it would be necessary for engineers to once again stop the flow of water over the falls. To begin with, then, authorities planned to construct another cofferdam in 2019. Yet they failed to secure the necessary $30 million in funding, meaning the project ultimately had to be postponed. According to officials, though, the project is still very much on the cards. They believe, too, that thanks to the power of social media, this future dewatering could be more beneficial for tourism than the previous attempt had been. But with an unknown number of people missing and presumed dead in the area since 1969, the falls may yet have more gruesome secrets to reveal. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.